So today we are addressing the question, what does an architect do? <laughs> Now, why would we ask such a question? Why would we bother talking about such a question on this show? So we can keep talking about ourselves as architects <laughs> yeah, a little yeah, bit more, yeah, yeah. isn't it? No, but, but, why, but like, why would we ask this question? Well, I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a broad and ambitious question. Um, to me, I think it's kind of necessary because I always feel like when I tell my family or my friends I'm an architect, they don't really understand what that means. They mm -hmm. don't really know what I do. Or if they do, they're just thinking, okay, well, she designs buildings or interiors or like, you know, like somebody hires her and like she comes up with a design and that's it. Yeah. You know, it's like snapping the fingers and that's, that's <laughs> right. it. Right, right. And I'm like, ah, yeah. you know. Let me like, reach into my magic bag you know, and pull like, out well, something. It, an, archi an architect does a lot of things, things that you probably would not even think they would do. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a, a big mystery world, to be honest. So I feel it's a, it's a good question to ask, um, and yeah. you know some of our listeners might not be architect, and they might wonder what does an architect exactly do or can do, right? Yeah, I think it's a worthwhile question because uh, from our experience, and I think most uh, practitioners would agree with this, that within the general public, anyone who's not a practicing architect or not in the architecture community, um, there are a lot of Uh, preconceptions and, and ideas of what architects do and a lot of times they're correct and a lot of times they're not right or they are one sliver of the you know the whole pie of, of what we do um, some common ones for example would be that I think people I think some people think about architects more as artists and they view them more in that side of the spectrum of from the artistic to the pragmatic they view them more as artists and they hire an architect for that design vision the the vision the conceptual vision the artistic vision and they they expect the architect to have um essentially curating and sculpture uh, sculpture skills right you want that ability for them to curate things and compose beautiful spaces and buildings and whatever whatever right um On the other hand, there are people who think of architects mainly in, in a more professional, technical sense and almost like a requirement to to have the project get done because they realize, okay, like legally speaking... Like a professional speaking, service. Professional service. I must have an architect to stamp these drawings to get approved get by the building permit. department, right? Yeah. to get my permit. And I need an architect to draw up the technical things because I need I need building drawings. It's just an assumption we need building drawings. Um, not necessarily because they understand how the drawings are going to be used, but just that we need them. So I need an architect for those. And there's a lot of, I think, these kinds of examples of how people view architects. One that's always kind of perplexed me, and let me know if you've come across this, is a lot of times people who um, want to hire an architect or they're interested in studying architecture, they, they think that an architect... To be an architect, you must be really good at math. <laughs> and, I get that all the time, and I'm like, right? look, man, I really wasn't good at math. <laughs> I'm an architect. Everything's possible here. Are you a good architect? Though? That's the question. I'm very good. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, you need, to, you need to have some fundamental skills in the mathematics department, but... You need to have a logical brain. I don't know that it means math, right. but it needs to be logical. Right. I think that's a good point. That's a good point. And uh, that's actually something that John Lum, who was a recent-ish guest on the show, brought up that it's architects. So from the designer's perspective, being good at math is important for architecture, not because you can, you're a whiz kid at math, but because you're learning how to think abstractly in an abstract system and being systematic and logical while also at some point being creative. Mm -hmm. um, The, the more advanced you are in math, the more creative it gets. Right. Uh, but I do think for the layperson, they think that architects um, are are good or should be good at math because they associate that with engineering. So it's like, you must have a arch architect, you must be very good at math because you must be very good at understanding structures and even designing structures and whatever. And... Um, I can understand how a person would think that, but as an from an insider's perspective, insider's perspective, I'm kind of like, well, no, because in a certain sense, like there are architects and there are engineers, and for every project, right, and you have to have an engineer, and an engineer is of course the one who designs the structure. They do the calculations to make sure the structure is. Of, of sound uh, integrity, that the building's not going to stand up, that it can resist certain wind forces, uh, seismic loads, and live load, and all the other things, right? 
that's what they do. We architects do not do that. Uh, like we, we have a, a very good general sense of structures and what's going to be required when we go to design things. So we were not like way in the stratosphere of being unrealistic, but we do not calculate things. We do not use mathematics in that sense, like ever, because uh, it's very dangerous. Like we, that's not our education. That's not our expertise. And I feel like that's, that's, uh, that's a good point to raise because it's almost like oftentimes people would think of architects as engineer in that sense, people right. who provide a technical service for a specific outcome. But to me, the biggest part that they're missing is that the whole creative process, mm -hmm. architects are creative. Uh, they provide solutions, they provide technical solutions, but first and foremost, they're creative, they're creators. Yeah. And that whole creation process means that, you know, you have to wear different hats and be doing different things in order to get there. Yeah. I, it's not just I snap my finger and I have a design. Like it's it's <laughs> I yeah. mean you can do that and it'd probably be a very unsuccessful project, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it, it 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 demands a lot more than that. Yeah, I think one way to think about to, to better understand what an architect does is to look at the th the let's say the three primary people involved in a project. And there's a lot of times more than these three, but let's say there's the architect, the construction manager or the contractor, and then the engineer, those three. Well, the engineer is the one who's, again, designing the structures, engineering the building so it doesn't fall down and et cetera. The contractor or construction manager, they're the ones in charge of making sure it gets built, right? So you have a person to make sure it stands up. You have a person to make sure it gets built correctly. Um, what's left to do, right? The remainder falls into the architect's, uh, you know, purview essentially, and that's one way to think about it, right? Is kind of process of elimination. Yeah, but also the architect is the one who came up with the idea of yeah, what yeah, the other yeah. ones are doing. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, right? absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think we're going to kind of, uh, dear listener, we're going to kind of talk through this question: What does an architect do chronologically? Because it's in terms of a project process, because it's sure. easiest. I think for me. Um, the one summary sentence that is the best that I can think of that defines what an architect does and like holistically is an architect designs buildings and helps ensure that they get realized correctly. That's if you hire an architect for what they're meant to be doing. What, what do you mean by meant to be doing? Well, if you shortcut the process, you hire the architect just for the creative process and you ditch him during construction of the project, you're probably not going to get that. Yeah, no, no, no. That's that's not a good so idea. The typical typical process is to have the architect from A to Z. Well, let, let's talk about that real quick to, to clarify for people. Um, so, well, I don't want to use the word traditionally because it gets, it gets into like what did the architect right. first do and whatever and they were first associated with builders and then drawings were invented and then now it became a profession to draw versus build and all that stuff but what, but what you're saying marina is that um the way we would do architecture and most uh, or a lot of professionals would prefer to do it is they would come up with the design but they'd also be involved during the construction of the project to make sure that the building is being constructed according to the, the design intent, according to the design which is being conveyed via the drawings. And a lot, it's become more common now, I think, for architects to only do the first part. Um, why this is, I have, I have speculations, but for an architect or a client to hire an architect just to come up with the drawing, sometimes it's not even construction drawings they produce, it's just sketches. Right? Like we've seen right. this a lot, sketches, and then you hand it off to whoever. I'm I'm done. I leave the project as an architect, right? And the client's left uh, on their own to get the thing built. I mean, look, it's like you have a you have a kid, you have the you made this baby and you give it to a stranger and you're gonna hope this this baby is gonna turn like a great person. Well you gotta have extreme <laughs> confidence in that person taking care of the baby to make sure that happens. Right. Or you just stay around, stick around until the baby is mature enough to make sure it's a, it's a, it's a great person. Like there is, it, it's a process of creation and and giving away something. Yeah. But in in the giving away process, you don't want the soul of it to get lost during construction. Right, during construction. Yeah. Because it's it's bridging the gap from one world, which is the conceptual world, to the physical real world. Yep. So there needs to be some kind of hand holding between the two dimensions, you know, to make sure that it, it, it makes sense when it's done. Yeah. I think that's a great way of putting it. And we'll dive deeper into that in this episode. I think that 
an easy way to talk about this too is like the design portion of their of their roles and responsibilities and and what the architect does and then their involvement more on the construction side i understand in reality that a lot of times these two are overlapped um you're thinking about construction as an architect you're, you're thinking about construction issues and feasibility issues during design yeah. and during construction you're absolutely thinking about design issues yeah. but for the purposes of conversation it's easier to kind of just distinguish the two I think another easy way to think of to understand what an architect does in terms of design is you is to think backwards from the outcome. Mm -hmm. So so if you just imagine, if you just say like, okay, I'm going to design a building for someone, right? What does that require me to do? And whatever you can think of, that's what an architect does. All of those things. And there's like hundreds of things. Hundreds of different kinds of things that have to be done to fulfill that scenario of I'm going to design this giant structure for someone else that will be realized or built by a bunch of different people. What does it take to design a building for someone else? Whatever the answer is, the answers are that's what an architect does, right? Yep. Um, okay, so we should we go through the process then, right? Yeah, I think going through kind of the the, the big steps in the design process, you know, um, might help define what an architect does. So one of the things that I find is that a lot of um, clients, when they hire an architect, they hire the architect too late. That happens pretty often, mm -hmm. or they hire an architect, um, but they're thinking way too far ahead. Um, so. I think this comes from that most people are like, like you said, okay, I'm hiring an architect to design something for me. I meet you on day one. We have a 15 minute conversation. Design something for yeah, me. I know, yeah. And from an architect standpoint, that's like really difficult to do. And it's something that we're kind of actively always advocating against because, well, you can explain why. Why would we not just design something after a 10 minute conversation after basically hardly knowing what the client, who the client is and what they're trying to achieve? Well, because I think if you're trying to design something that, that is always in response to something else, and um, if you just jump into design without looking at the context or doing some research or analysis, you know, is the result going to be relevant to who or where you're trying to design the project? Yes. Uh, we're not just designing a spoon or a cup that's going to be used by millions of people in different places at different time of the day through different you know cycles of history and time and things right like mm. we're designing for a specific person or a specific group of people in specific location everything is very spe hyper specific therefore the response cannot come out of nowhere right there is right. already too much information embedded within the project seed right mm. to be ignored mm -hmm. And I think that's that's where the design should start. It should start from those seeds and looking at them and understanding them. And I would say even if the thing we're designing is uh, more is for a mass consumer market, there's still a lot of research and analysis that has to be done. I mean, if you think about designing anything, whatever it is, the first thing you do is research. Yeah. Like to understand. So if I'm going to make a spoon in your example that's going to be sold on Amazon and I want to make a bunch of money on Amazon and it's supposed to be kind of modern-ish or whatever, the first thing I would do is a bunch of research. What are the spoons that are out there? What's the price point, mm -hmm. right? And um, that's a different game because that's that's a, a, you know, what product, product to consumer relationship to a bunch of people. But it's not dissimilar in terms of uh, design, in, in terms of process as designing a structure for one client or a, even if it's a public library or a public structure. Um, it, you know, you said you're responding to things, you're responding to things as, as a designer. That's, that, and, and that's true, you know. So essentially your first step as a designer, as an architect rather, is to be an analysis and a researcher and and uh, and that is a, a hat that the architect wears, but that's the tasks. Those are the responsibilities. Those are the things you have to do, right? What would we do in terms of research? I mean, it could be anything. You know, it's it's, it's like detective work, right? Like you're putting on your your, your Sherlock Holmes hat and you go and like. <laughs> that's you know, what you, I do. You when ask... I, to I have a pipe and I have a hat and a yeah, little. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm like Perry Mason, right? Like oh, you, you go. Yeah. You ask a bunch of questions to clients. You you look at maps of the site. You look at data. You look at uh, you know who's the neighbor next door. What's the view? What's the climate? Yep. You know what's my client's need? Uh, you know what's their budget? What's their schedule? 
and mm -hmm. then like you know things that are more specific to the design itself yeah um, because uh, yeah. It, it's it's almost like when you go to you know the client goes to the doctor to get a treatment mm -hmm. but they don't really know the treat what the treatment is for right and and it's the job of the doctor to give them the diagnosis of well you got i don't know pneumonia or you got cancer therefore that's the treatment you need right, right? you're not just going to give a treatment not knowing what the person is here for yeah. you know even if they they know they're sick they might not know exactly what they have right yeah. it's kind of no, it's similar. Yeah, it's I mean, similar. There, there's this idea of problem solving in architecture. We've heard it a lot of times in this show. It's been said a lot of times within the profession. And uh, this is a common answer you will get from architects if you ask them, what do you do? I, I solve problems. Architects solve problems. And um, there's a lot of ways to dissect that. But the one easy way to understand it is, it is that means that you are responding to a condition. You're responding to a set of constraints, a, a context, um, a set of variables, a set of givens. Right, and those can be uh, perceived or understood, conceived as a, a problem or a mm -hmm. series of problems that you're working through. It would be highly irresponsible of an architect to just reach into their black bag <laughs> and pull out, wham! What do you think of this one? And they're like, yeah, that looks good. Let's do it. Okay, well. Um, there are some instances where you can do that if it's more of an art installation or there's less responsibility. But, you know, if we're talking about uh, public sector structures, no, you can't do that, right? There's a lot of things to be involved. And even if we're talking about uh, a house for an individual, a ground up house, and let's say this person can afford and they have like eight houses across the world, still, resp they're responsible to some degree to just pull out, to some degree, to just pull out a random thing out of your bag and say, like, okay, how about this? Does this look cool to you? Yeah, let's do it. Um, you know, the it, this is why architecture is different from an off-the-shelf product, right? Most things we buy and most um, consuming experiences we have are like, I don't know, phones, watches, iPhones, clothing. Most of these things, they're pre-made and pre-designed, right? They exist. They're on a shelf. And I just need to select the one that I like. And maybe I can get a different color with different interiors or like, I don't know, whatever, whatever, right? Um, architecture is like the most custom version of a product in a certain sense yeah i mean there was no two buildings alike i mean yeah it's if you're designing store. for someone right <laughs> and so so but to, you, so you are responding to things and the reason why it's so important to first start and first to to be an analysis and a researcher is because the design that you come up with and the building that that's get that's that gets constructed is going to have its fingers in a lot of different questions and issues yeah so it's almost like i don't know if 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 i'm asked to do something uh, i don't know let's say wash the dishes as a task i'm kind of spitballing here uh i'm asked to wash the dishes and there are the dirty dishes there's the soap there's a the sponge and there's a drying rack right or a dish rack i pretty much know what to do there's there's only like four things involved and the, the outcome and the direction is really clear dirty dishes need to be made clean and they're going to dry um, that doesn't require a lot of input. I don't need to know like why I'm washing the dishes. I don't need to know who I'm washing the dishes for. There's a lot of other, I don't need to know the budget for the dishes. There's a lot of things involved. I don't need to know it's because it, the task is really straightforward. It's very linear also. Uh, with a building, there are so many different issues at play that it's, that's also why in the very beginning, a, a lot of good architects will just ask a ton of questions to the client. And they spend a lot of time doing this because the more we can understand the scenario, right, and all the givens, the better we can solve the problem. Yeah, and oftentimes I feel like clients are, they're very excited about the project to get started and they yes. want to start seeing design. So they don't really understand the importance of taking the time to analyze and research prior to start creating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, sometimes clients come to the architect and they're like, this is what I need, this is what I want, what else do you need to start? And and sometimes they, th they think they need certain things or they want certain things, but it's the job of the architect to kind of like d dig deep mm -hmm. to see really, you know, w what those means and what is the most crucial information that sometimes even hiding below the, the surface of the information that the client will share. That's a good point because it's not like the information is always right there on paper for no, you. you know. So if we're looking at the math problem analogy, right, uh, solve this math problem. And so Okay, so a, an architect trying to design a building without knowing 
all the variables or as many as they can would be like someone saying, solve this math problem. I'm only going to show you half of it. Right. You're like, okay, well, can't. I can try, but if there's a lot of money at stake and, you know, public health or whatever, it seems resp irresponsible <laughs> to try and solve this and give, and give me all the information. Um, and that's what it's like, right? <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 the, and the research and analysis part is also a way to kind of, you know, make a hierarchy of the information about mm -hmm. the project and what is most important, what is least important. You know, I'm thinking of, you know, the interview we had with Marion, uh, Marion Weiss, mm -hmm. right? When their office works on big, big project, like let's say school projects, right? You have a bunch of different people who each have their own wish list. You can satisfy all of them. You kind of have to do the research of like what is most important, how are things being integrated. Like yeah. it takes a lot of effort and time to pull out the information, extract it, and recompose it in a way that makes sense and that will guide the design. Yes. Um, and that cannot be done right if you don't do research and you don't analyze things. Prior so to so I, I think there's three things that the architect does that you brought up. The first is research. That is the gathering mm -hmm. information, the mining of information. And sometimes that information is there. You have to just go get it. Zoning code regulations. Yeah. The, I mean, it's really obvious of the budget. They have a budget. <laughs> Most often clients have a budget, right? The schedule. That stuff is readily available. You just need to ask for it or it needs to be given to you. But there's also mining for information that you, that you brought up, which is... Um, it's not the surface. It's it's hard to find, and that is what's within the client. The client, as you said, they might respond and say, "Okay, I want this thing, right?" And an architect could say, "Okay, I write that down. That's now one of the things that must be incorporated, or that's like a given. That's one of the variables. It's a factor. That's a piece of information in my research." But if you're dealing with preferences, right? And sometimes it's even program. It's function of the building. It's it's like number of rooms I need. The architect still has to go further, and that's why a client, the architect will ask clients the same question about this one issue over and over and over again, because think how often um, in a project or even life, uh, you ask a question, someone responds, but there's another layer of information to it. Like why am I? Why did this person give me this mm -hmm. answer? Right. That's the thing that the architect wants to understand. Not that I gotta have three bedrooms and they all must be least. I need them to be 15 by 10 feet. But why do you need that? Because then that gets the root of the whole thing. Now we can find something that's probably better for you. But anyway, so mining for information. Um, and then mining for, for information from the client. I would say the architect, uh, th their task is almost like... Um, I don't want to say therapist, but like uh, they have to dig deeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a relationship yeah, yeah. there, right? There, yeah. There's a kind of like confidant role yeah. that's yeah. happening the third thing uh which i've forgotten now because it went on for too long was something else you said that was really good <laughs> about what the architect does <laughs> right. was it what was it you said Co just composing like recomposing things oh yes there, there we go thank you you're welcome the, th the third thing is that the architect at, at this phase uh, is an organizer right their task and what they do is they organize information and they provide structure to the information they provide hierarchy to the information and that those are are in some ways you know there are three different things already right to to bother to look into stuff to find to research stuff and to wear your detective hat that's one role in a certain sense the being a good relation having a good relationship with the client a good friend a, a confidant that's a different thing and then the third thing of being able to take all this stuff and organize it in some manner that is in some regards also a, a, a third mindset already mm -hmm. And this is just in the research phase. <laughs> this is the beginning of the project. This project's. is just the beginning. This is before so, we even designed anything. I know. Um, okay. Then we move to, uh, before we get to the design, there's actually another phase, which is commonly referred to by architects as pre-design. Well, pre-design is probably when you, you know, when the architect helps you, um, you know, kind of define a little more clearly the different things that compose the project. Right. right? Like, okay, so what, well, yeah. maybe we're going to start looking at the schedule a little more clearly mm -hmm. or maybe the program you know you wanted three bedrooms well let's see can we do three bedrooms should we do three bedrooms should be two and one two and a half mm -hmm. you know yeah and i mean the the uh research and ana anal analysis portion falls within pre-design by a lot of definitions but um pre-design is basically you're questioning the uh, the part of the givens and a lot of times it is a programmatic thing that's an important part you know, rethinking the relationship between spaces that clients assume need to be there. 
the, I feel, the difference I would say between analysis and the pre-design phase is yeah. that analysis you're just wearing like blind you're wearing blinders right like you're only looking one way just at the information pretty much more or less some interpretation but not really right. pre-design you start looking at that information with like your pink glasses your pre-design glasses right okay you, you start considering those in those information in term of how is that gonna translate into a design yeah potentially yeah right and and a lot of times you know we're breaking this up i think for the sake of the recording but a lot of times for the architects their gears are multiple gears are firing yeah. at any given moment so we're kind of scattered in that sense but um yeah, I, I think I think that's correct. I think the pre-design question also gets to a, another point, which is I think a lot of times clients will hire architects um, to do to do something that that fits within this lane. I need this thing done, this this task, right? This lane to be I don't know filled or whatever. I need someone to do that for me to help me do that. I need an architect for that. Right. And a lot of times it's again, I already know my budget. I already know my schedule. I already know this. This is the, I just need you to do this portion of it. But again, the architect does not approach any project in terms of this lane I'm going down. They approach it as I'm going to design something. Whatever is required for me to design the best thing, I'm going to do that. So very often um, clients will come to an architect with this kind of like, idea of how the relationship or the, or the architect's task and responsibilities and what they're going to do is it's how, how it's going to work how it's going to fit within these lanes if that makes sense and the architect the first thing they do is blow that up <laughs> and say well well let, let's take like 10 steps backwards because maybe it could be we need to actually shift to this other direction and that'll be much more productive successful better design save you money make you more money or whatever 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 um and a, a parallel way, uh, a lot of clients will buy a property, then hire an architect to help them do a remodel or to fix things they think they don't like. If you can, I would recommend you hire an architect first, have the arch assuming they're a good architect, have the architect with you when you're looking at properties to help you determine which ones makes makes the most sense. Not just in terms of like, okay, what's going to financially make sense to remodel this place, you know, which what has good structure, good views and good inherent uh, design to it, but uh, in terms of everything else too. Um, so again, I think it's like starting, like the architect's brain starts very early on in the process in that sense, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Now we get to design finally, the good, the good stuff, the goodies, um, the goodies. The goodies. So what are some of the things an architect does during design? Well, I think first, you know, um, you know, I would say typically architects approach the design and like, what's the big idea? Mm -hmm. You know, like big thinking, conceptual thinking, like what's, what's the big idea behind this, this building that we're going to create? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's probably one of them. Second one is that what, based on that big idea, that can be translated in a bunch of different ways, right? So that's where we start designing into different design iteration to find which one is the best one. We kind of have to develop, you know, a whole bunch of them to see uh, how that works. So we, we just generate ideas, you know, mm -hmm. big and small, and we go back and forth between them and we try different things. And it's kind of like a, a big think tank in there, you know, mm -hmm. like we're, we have all the information, we have all the design, you know, knowledge and all of that. What can we do? Like, how can we do it? Yeah, ideation. That's the first, right. one of the first things, right? Uh, who's going to have that, that, that spark of ingenuity, that innovative moment, that eureka moment, that that is worth, you know, it's, it's a funny question, like what's worth more, the execution of the building or like the big idea? And there's a debate, you know, which one is more important, but it could easily be argued that without that idea, Everything else is meaningless afterwards. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Like, and 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 ultimately, those ideas, even if they might, you know, the first ones are not the ones, they're support. They're communications support. They're a medium, right? That's being used to communicate between the client and the architect. Uh, say that again. Say that again. You, you, that's, that's a complicated thing you said there. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand what you're talking about, but but um, I'm saying that you know by doing ide ideation mm -hmm. um you know it's a it's it's a way of communication okay it's a way to to move the process forward and ideas are kind of the the 
to support the things that's going to be debatable, the things that's going to be shared and talked about between the client and the architect. Right. right. So you're talking. Don't have anything on paper if you don't have any ideas. How do you get the design moving forward? Right. Okay. So you're talking about. So, so I was talking more about, you know, the big idea, right? right? The the one thing that is the genius move, the genius position to have that you would pay someone the big bucks for right. to come up with this thing. But you're talking about. Um, sometimes as a way to get there and everyone gets there in different ways sometimes it is a eureka moment and you fucking sketch something with charcoal you know that's what it is rare um but in other times it is a process to get there and in that process because you're working with the client what you're saying is that it's not about doing one big sketch you know after your research and you say boom it's done client take it or leave it you're talking about your kind of pitch a bunch of small, small in quotes, small ideas and small drawings and small thing, uh, designs in a sense, right? To get the reaction, to understand them. Is that what you're talking about? To well, it's not so much you you pitch. It's more like you got that big idea. Okay, the client's on board. Now, how is that going to be made in the real world? Oh, okay. Like, I want the house to look like a. I want the the house to be the concept of a mushroom. Okay, that's very abstract. How do we make it happen? It's right? a mushroom, so is what you ID do. <laughs> one, it looks like a mushroom. ID two, mm -hmm. the structure is, I don't know, inspired from a mushroom. Or ID three, it develops on the side like mushroom grows or something, right? Like, oh, you know, nice. like it, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that those uh, smaller ideas, uh, you know, are a way to make progress to the design of the big I one. I see. I see. But see, this is all, this is a good example already in this conversation. There's like a, a, a ten, maybe even more different ways to approach the relationship between ideation and then execution, and how you understand one idea to be. I see. The way I interpreted what you were saying was that in order to move forward in the process, the architect has to put stuff down on paper, which therefore then they can see, and other people, in this case the client, can see, yeah. and it becomes a conversation. A, a point to talk off of yeah right? like you imagine the idea is like this little blob that you can hold in your hand right and mm -hmm. i'm just gonna pass it to you gonna pass it to me it's gonna bounce on the table yeah. we're gonna smash it we're gonna kick it uh, you, you know we're gonna see how it reacts <laughs> we're gonna poke does it, it come back it. does it breathe you right, know right. like no it's dead it's in the corner let's try the next one right yeah. it's kind of like this ping pong ball ideas are like ping pong balls right like right. you just use them to you know, get warmer and warmer and warmer and gets until you get very agile and maybe there is only one ping pong ball. So, so there's a there's a, a number of things here, uh, a roles <laughs> or tasks. The first is the architect is a is an ideator. They they have to have that conceptual spark, that that right. ignition that comes from where it comes from, intuition. It comes from experience. It comes from the research, of course. All of those things. It comes from their own backgrounds. Uh, they're a genius, you know, that, that ideation. They have to have the ability to put that down and express it in some way, which is a different thing. A lot of people have great ideas, but you put it down on paper, you need the skill set to do that, Com computer, put in the computer or on the paper, and you need, um, so that's the next thing. Um, then the third thing, uh, there was four, but the third thing is that when that gets shown to someone else, oh no, the third thing is being able to critique it, right? And being a person who can come up with their own that they think is a magnificent idea and expressing that idea is not the same thing as being able to look at that thing objectively and critique it. That is the th that is the third aspect in the in in this part of the conversation uh, of what the architect does. They critique constantly, right? The fourth They're thing. Very opinionated people. We have to be. We, we have, have to be. Well, yeah, I mean, you cannot be opinionated, but you're not going to really grow or move forward or, or push things. But this is also the difference between, I would say, a lot of artists and architects, right? An artist can afford to have their way of thinking and their, I don't know, concept or whatever and execute it. And that's it. That's their only responsibility they have. They put it out there in the world and that's it. An architect, you can't really do that because you have responsibility to other people. Mm -hmm. we, you know, so that's why the ability for the architect to be a critic, to an architect to perform critiques, is really, really, really important. The fourth thing that came up was more in terms of process. Is that the architect? It goes back again to relationship. I mm -hmm. don't know what the title would be, but what the architect does is they are a well a listener. 
would be one thing, right? They, it's, it is a conversation that I'm having with the client in this case. And as you said, the ping pong ball blob thing is the thing that we're, is the potato we're passing back and yeah, forth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> potato, ping pong ball, mushroom, you know, it's all the same. The potato that we're passing back and forth. And part of my job is not to not only create this potato, but then show it, <laughs> throw it at you, throw it at you and see how you respond and listen and watch intently to interpret and decipher what you're saying. Um, and the reason, and that sounds maybe overkill. Um, it's like, well, yeah, the client tells you what they think and then that's it. Well, no, there's more than that because a lot of times, again, there's layers to why someone says something, right? They might have an aversion to this thing because of their childhood background, which I'm not privy to. I don't know about that, right? There's a lot of other things at play or there's a, another person on the client side of the team of the clients that they don't like this or that, or, or there's other forces that are happening here. So being a listener uh, of sorts in that sense. You know. I mean, when you think about it, it's very interesting to be an architect because you're designing things for for strangers. Yeah, for right? strangers. For strangers. And you only have that much amount of time to get them to know very personally, very, very deeply, to yes. come up with something that is going to mean a lot to them and their, you know, their daily life and daily use, right? I mean, it's an immense challenge to succeed in doing that uh, because of all of the impossibilities that just comes to mind when I tell you that. I mean, like, what are the odds that this is going to work out, right? Like, yeah. it's like speed dating, it is. but with a ex pretty expensive outcome at the end. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then yeah. Uh, never call me back, you know, <laughs> potential type of relationship. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's, it's weird. It's weird. It and, is weird. Um, it's weird. And I think the human aspect of, of, you know, hiring an architect is something that also people don't often think about. You know, like when I, when I, was, when I was telling you, when I tell my parents or my family, like I'm an architect, they don't think about like me talking to clients and trying to get to know them and asking them the most rudimentary questions in order for me to shed some light on like how I should design their kitchen. Mm -hmm. You know, what, is that, what does it mean to them, right? Like you would think that I've designed 30 kitchens already. Like why can I not design a 30, 30, another one? Right, but it's not just the amount; it's it's who you're doing it for, yeah. and and you know it requires having like good people skills, like you said, being a good listener, being a good communicator, being confident, even sometimes becoming a friend, yeah. you know, with the client. It's and it's something that's crucial to I think making the process successful is that human exchange as part of the creative process. That it's just super important. It is, and that applies for small-scale projects, right? Mm -hmm. And it applies for bigger projects. Now, the things that you're hunting for in a bigger project and the politics uh, grow, obviously, but still is the same structure in terms of the approach, right? And the things you have to look out for and what the architect does and the things they do. Um, so I would say all that stuff applies to roughly the conceptual design portion, we could say. And concept design uh, in the standard building process is you, there are design drawings, there are sketches. Um, and of course, the architect is thinking about other issues of budget and the more pragmatic or technical things. But we haven't usually really dived into the technical things quite yet. So after the uh, flubber ball that we've been tossing around, I would say we then move to schematic design and design development. And, and I think in both of these two phases, we can wrap them up into one, I think. Things become a little bit different. There are other responsibilities and other things the architect does, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, for those who are not familiar with those phases, that's pretty much when you start, like, drawing where things are going to go, how big they're going to be. Exactly. You know, it's if very you close have to windows, exactly. where well, the walls, no. where well, the doors, what size the room is, you know, like what's the workflow and, and, you know, like usage and the adjacencies between spaces, like it becomes a lot more real in those faces than the previous one. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's also where architects have to become problem solvers in a way. Yeah. Because things become more real. Um, so, you know, how is this door going to work if I have a cabinet over there? Uh, how is the garage going to be hidden from this view? Well, technically, how we, could we make that work, right? Yeah. Um, or the client just wanted to change something, but we've designed it a different way. How could we integrate it in? So it, it's it's a lot more, those phases are... Uh, technical? A lot more technical, but still in a very soft yes. way. 
right? Yeah. They're not like technical, like this is it, right? Yeah. They're still flexible, they can still move, they can still like, you know, morph as they need to. Yeah. No, I, I think what you said makes total sense. Um, the, the transition, one way to think about it is that we could say concept design are sketches. And I use that word mostly because the layperson understands what a sketch, we can visualize right. what a sketch is. When we get to SD and DD, now we're talking about what I would describe as real building drawings. <laughs> Like actually, like real, like the ex uh, pretty close to the exact thicknesses of the walls. If we're talking about stand standard buildings, you know, you said the dimensions of the doors and the windows, how it aligns with zoning codes and other building codes, and like you said, you open up this door that blocks that thing. How do you resolve that? If you swing this way or that way, maybe it gets bigger, maybe it moves a little bit. It's all the, it's all the small stuff that in a cool looking sketch. You wouldn't think about because you're sold by the sketch and you're like oh looks good we got a design this this is the, the the sketch is the design now let's go build it but that's all the other things that happen in real use and and more real constraints that have to be thought about that you would not at first see in a sketch you would see when you dive deep dive deeper into the process and then if you were to build off the sketch you'd be like wow this feels kind of like awkward in here and like oh this doesn't really function correctly or the space feels a little bit odd because nothing's been finessed yet mm -hmm. right um so i i do think that problem solver is a good title and problem solving is a good task to describe this portion of the phase i mean problem solving can be used throughout uh yeah. we've talked about this podcast but problem solving a lot of times for people the way they perceive it is that there's a discernible very well defined issue you've got to find a solution for it and um the way you solve a problem in the design of a building a lot of times is thinking outside of the confines of the problem if mm -hmm, that makes mm -hmm. sense so i'm i don't know i'm trying to think of a good example i, I don't know i mean uh let's say that a hallway's too narrow i'm making something up hall was too narrow okay well i guess the obvious thing is you make it wider you make it wider that affects everything else in the house or the building or the project right how do you do that or maybe it's you don't have to make it wider maybe it's just a matter of proportion like i think i used the hallway in the past on this i have obsessed with hallways yeah, i can't tell that one is specific um you know or or whatever but there's there's like maybe like 30 different ways to solve a problem and then your job is to find the best way to solve the problem that's going to meet all the different criteria yeah you know so i think problem solving is appropriate for for that port uh, portion but it's also the phase i think where the architects becomes maybe a little bit more like an event planner okay like, you know things start to get defined a lot more during sd and dd right and schematic you, design and design development right like you know you 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 got you know a little bit like what needs to happen when things need to happen you know like what are the different steps you're gonna have to go through mm -hmm. for the whole project you know, okay, well, today we're going to look at the kitchen, tomorrow we look at the bathroom, you know, um, in a month we'll pick out the furniture, you know, like that kind of... Timeline. Timeline, sequencing, uh, sequence of events, you know, sequence of tasks, mm -hmm. you know, like, because these drawings are more refined than the previous one, they're still not as much defined as the next one, right? Say that again. <laughs> Say that again. The schematic design and mm -hmm. design development drawings are more defined than conceptual drawings. Okay. But they're less defined than construction documents. Right. Right. So there is this idea of progression and keeping things moving and on track. Yes. Right. So the architect is the one who kind of has this overall map of the project and understanding of everything that needs to happen in what order. Right. Um, so I think that's, and that's, to me, particularly in those phases when it becomes even more important because things are getting more real and more real and more real, mm -hmm. and we got to make sure that we hit all the points that needs to be hit. Yeah. I think the idea of an event planner, which maybe for some architects sounds like, you know, it's a little bit, I don't want to say degrading because I don't want to hate on the event planners, but, um, Superfic yeah, yeah, yeah it know. sounds a little, little superficial or whatever, but yeah. I think it's a good adjective because I think people understand it. Like an event planner has to think about the smallest fucking details and the biggest things of like, let's make sure <laughs> this thing happens. Let's make sure, you know, all the stuff arrives on time for the wedding or for the whatever. Just make sure the client is thrilled at the end. Right. And like know. make sure everyone's happy, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Architect is very similar in that sense. Absolutely. And there's this other 
quality of um, you know the tasks that we have to do are incredibly small and detailed. It's in terms of physical scale, like quarter inch, half an inch, one eighth of an inch, three sixteenths. Like what is it? You know, like literally that to um, massive scale, right? And that goes in terms of of schedule, of course, too. You're spending you're sinking a couple hours looking at this one detail that's the size of, you know, a pen, right? The width of a pen. Um, and at the same time, you're zooming back out and now you're thinking about the schedule, you know, for the next three months or a year and whatnot. And that is um, that that is one of the things that, that we do constantly, I think, is like we go back and forth and it's kind of, ex ex it's kind of it's, exhausting, it's kind to be of honest. A, you like, know, if there is a circus, like we're the ones juggling Right. We have all different color and size bottles that, right. you know, make the spectacle. Right, 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 you right. You know, and we can't drop any. <laughs> it, but it, it also reminded me that there's this, um, uh, I think if an architect is working closely with the client, and of course, if they have employees and they're working with a the team, there's a there's the whole like team leadership responsibilities and tasks, which I don't really want to get into because that's like more generic stuff. But there is something about ensuring that a project is moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, in terms of like legitimate schedule, we are hitting our deadlines, we're not getting delayed, but the spirit and the emotion of a project. To some people, that might sound kind of like wishy-washy, like, all right, get out of here with your like, <laughs> your emotional aspect of the project. But when you're doing something that is this long and this expensive, and there's this many problems to solve constantly, and you're working with someone who, let's say, has not done this before, that part of the process and that part of what the architect does, moving it forward and keeping the ship afloat might be, it, it's easily definitely one of the most, the top three most important things that an architect does, 100%. That's also why we hear on this podcast, a lot of times architects will say it's the relationships, it's with the clients, it's, it's, it's you know, architects actually often say like, I'm very proud to, 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 to state that I never abandon a project. Now, from an outsider's perspective, it's like, well, I fucking hope not. <laughs> like, that's crazy. It's, of course, like, why are you even saying that? Why are you bringing up something so negative? To bring it up because it takes a lot to stay with a 12 month, 18th month, two year, four, whatever year project, all the way through when, you know, there are a lot of issues uh, that are constantly coming up. And on top of that, making sure the client stays informed, but also not overwhelmed and depressed by all the things that. The architect is being hit with daily you know that's the thing i mean you know uh, you i mean you could do a house without hiring an architect you could do oh it with a contractor you could do it yourself yourself if you wanted um but the the and the human aspect of of the process the architect takes on the stuff that you don't want to take on it takes on the responsibility of making sure things are moving it takes on the stress that that what that brings mm -hmm. you know um it's it's you know, it's a service that's not for everyone, that's not accessible to everybody, unfortunately. Um, but when it is, like, that's what you should use an architect for, not to stress out, not to worry, not to micromanage things. Like, that's what architects do. Yeah, so that's the other role of the architect, and this is more to do with the client relationship, is that um, we are um, we, we're coaches. Uh, or team ca team captains is another a better way to put it rather than a coach because a team captain um, there's the morale behind the team and there's also this a little bit of like of all the stuff I know going on in a project I'm not going to tell the client all that stuff no, I know. because it would frankly depress them and overwhelm them and really stress them out and um, so I do consider it as part of my job and one of the things I do is to inform clients when they need to be informed and to tell them things in a certain way that doesn't freak them out and also at the end of the day let's be honest to filter. to filter because if, if i wasn't filtering then like what am i doing right like then in a certain sense if, if i come to the client with every single problem and every single question do you like this do you like that do you prefer this thing and how do we solve this how do we solve that they're like why did i hire you right? yeah. how are you to take care of this for me <laughs> you know um so i think now we move to construction documentation and construction drawings. Yeah, the construction documentation is, uh, it's a lot of work. And that's where maybe like architects are more like engineer, like things get more complicated, mm -hmm. more technical, more precise, more about the numbers and how it's made, right? Um, but it's, 
but beyond the technical aspect of those drawings, and that's how they differ from the previous one, is that they're extremely detailed and technical. Yeah. Those drawings, architects do these drawings not for fun. They do it, <laughs> you know, it, not because they're, hobby, like, they're like geeky yeah. and they love technical things and like, you know, lots of complicated drawings because they're very complicated drawings. They do them because it's a way to communicate, right? That 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 baby that we created and hand it off to someone else. Mm -hmm. Why well, don't hand off a baby to someone else without giving them instruction? When does he need to eat? How long does he need to sleep? <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, like you, How do you don't I do use that, this right? Thing? Like, so that's kind of what, what, why we do construction documents is because we need to communicate our ideas in a way that is understood by the other world, by the other side, which is the construction realm. Yeah, so I, so this requires um, it requires a person to not only okay. There's a lot of things to not only understand how a building gets put together, right, uh, and therefore be, and then drawing it, and then making sure everything's kind of coordinated, but it requires understanding it from an outsider's perspective or, or the contractor's perspective. Yeah. Like when you've been working on a project for I don't know nine months or something, right, and you're getting into CDs or you're at you're within the thick of CDs, let's say. Um, you know, the architect knows the project really, really, really well. You, it is an odd thing, it's a difficult thing to create anything that essentially is going to be read and interpreted by someone else. And you want them to understand that thing as well as you do. The clarity of communication, that uh, the ability to, to see that and to understand that is very, very difficult. And it's a high level skill set high level skill set because we're not talking about oh let's have a verbal conversation where we've all been speaking and listening for what 30 40 50 60 years of our lives okay we can have a five minute chat to clarify construction drawings are contractual uh um, artifacts right whatever you put down that in essence becomes uh part of the contract in a certain sense so um there's no room for error at all, um, but it also means that it needs to again going back to clarity. Like you're trying to communicate something without being there, but yeah. through a language that is not something we've all learned. Like if yeah. you know, writing a short paragraph uh, is more or less something we can all do and understand. But drawings are much more sophisticated because they're all over the space, space all over the place, space interlinked between one sheet and the next. Well, that's the thing. It's like it's not just one isolated drawing with all of the information. It's that this drawing needs to relate to another drawing that relates to a bigger drawing that relates to another one mm -hmm. that maybe the mechanical engineer has, and then this one related also to the structural engineer. It's kind of like this and then the specs. arborescence yeah. of of links between information, and clarity is essential. That's why, yeah, like architects have to have their their ideas clear to do those things because it's extremely important. And those are the documents that the guy you hire to build the building is going to, you know, use in the field to erect the building. So yeah. there's a lot at stake here. You can't make a mistake. You've got to be clear. If you make a mistake, there is like, you know, impact, financial impact, schedule impact, you know, like repercussions are, are real. Yes. They're not just a, a mistake on paper you can erase and correct. Like it's it's happening. So one of the things the architect does, uh, or they the skills I guess I have, is um, they're highly, highly thorough. And at this point, um, it, this is also where uh, there are a lot of different kinds of architects, especially in a larger office, let's say. Generally, um, not everybody is doing uh, all the different phases of the project, as I've described it, all the different uh, hats of responsibility mm -hmm. equally. It tends to be over the course of like 10, 15 years, people will kind of go down, go toward a, uh, a specific um, set of tasks that they prefer. So you'll find technical architects and their job is to solve technical things. You find project managers and their job is more like event planner, sort of, we could say, in a certain way. And you'll find people who are more of designers. And roughly those are the three kind of and it makes sense if you think about it because those are almost different types of personalities yeah but um I, I, we could say a drew capital a architect right uh is at the very least highly qualified in all three of those because that's what it takes to do a building um so it, in doing cds what does an architect do um they are they are extremely thorough and detailed people um but they also 
Well, there is also the whole coordination aspect. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Right. Like we're team players, like the project cannot exist with just the architect. You need the consultants, you need the contractor, you need all of these other people to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Right. We can't do it all. It's not yeah. possible. Yeah. And like you said, we're team captain. That means like, okay, well, all of those team members will respond to us or communicate to us for anything because you need a person at the top who's kind of like managing the information mm -hmm. and making sure things are moving on all of the different fields and, and plates that it needs to move, right? And so it's a managerial aspect of, of uh, being the team captain. It's the cheering aspect of being the team captain. You got to make sure everybody's involved and, and well collaborating and, you know, nice to each other and, and make sure they're doing their job. <laughs> hey, you knock it off. You know, yeah. but it's also the work that they're each doing. As architects, we have an understanding of structural engineering and how, you know, structure looks like and work. We have an understanding of mechanical systems. Yeah. We have an understanding of construction, right? So we're kind of the... The, the the main the team captain who has a pretty broad knowledge on all of those fields in order to make sure that what we've designed at first by ourselves uh, you know uh, makes sense with those different systems that need to be implemented yeah um, so I think the architect as composer uh, is 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 one way to think about it too a good composer in terms of like the the sculpture of the building right, right? yeah that's fine like artistic compo uh, composition but uh, composer also in terms of uh, if you're composer of a wind orchestra uh, you know and, and you're, you're writing music you have to have an understanding of all the <laughs> instruments, obviously. You know, like, right? <coughs> you're not. You're, you're not. In, you might not be an expert performer uh, in music performance in all of the. You know, I don't know, fifteen, twenty instruments, right? But you have a good understanding of it. You understand how to weave them together, and that's for creating a a, a work of art, a, a, a scripture, right? But the same thing applies in terms of organization and team management or management of, yeah, it's a, it's a team, team management of all the people you mentioned, like you're the composer of all these different people and making sure that they interact and work with each other and their work does so also yeah. so that you can get to this outcome. Yeah, you know, like you designed this uh, five-story building with a giant atrium, right? You took to yeah. Sam, the structural engineer, and he put like... You know slabs at every level and you're like dude like no like, you can do that right <laughs> like, that Did you doesn't look work at the like drawings? can you can you come up with something that you know preserves this aspect of the design because that's you know that was the big picture idea and then he comes back the next week and he came up with something and we discuss negotiation and, you go back and forth and then what he's working on his thing you know you're chatting with uh bob from the mechanical engineering term and team and you're Good like okay Baba. we don't want to see ac units hanging around the windows like how could that work with the structure that sam came up with last week and while you're meeting with that guy, you have to send a follow-up email to make sure that the previous guy is, you know, working on the structure stuff. Yeah. And then next week we have a meeting all together to like look at it and make sure, you know, like we're thinking about everything because the the, the biggest aspect of having all of these people involved in the team for a project is to make sure that everything has been thought about. Yeah. You know, and we don't run into building collapsing or like on-site construction things that no one ever looked at or thought of, right? We have a lot on our plate and they have a lot on their plate. And that, that's why those interactions and, and the, the, the collaboration of the team is crucial. Super crucial. And I, I wish I could find an analogy to convey how complex a building can be, especially at the larger scale, even a smaller scale, like all the different people involved. I would say if you involved. think of a, of a human body, it's probably as complex as a human body. Well, that's uh, pretty complex, but yeah. It's pretty complex. Right, right. I mean, and again, you know, you think like the big scale and the smallest, tiniest scale. The difficult thing is that when you, in a building, when you do make one change or you're discussing one issue, it affects like another 15 things. And yeah. so like you, it almost feels, I, I don't know, I don't have kids, but it almost feels like, you know, when you see um, in a scene in a movie, a parent has like five kids and take care of one kid and like another kid's missing. <laughs> they take care of that one and the other two is missing. And then like three disappear and then three show up. You're like, what the fuck? How did, is this a magic trick or something? Like, are you balls and cups that are reappearing yeah, like yeah, how is yeah. this working it's a or like whack-a-mole you know hit one yeah. and then one pops up it's like <laughs> god damn it the state it's the same thing and the same thing happens in in so that, that's in terms of coordination the same thing applies to the design itself so this is why when we design a space or a room let's say a room to keep it simple and a, someone the client says like okay let's change this it's like oh and they're like, can we change this? It's like, we can. I, I got to think about whether or not that's good because 
uh, you know, the last week, it took us a week to come up with this. And it wasn't a week to come up with the big idea. It was a week to make sure everything fits. So if you we went with this with this route, we know it's going to work out. You change something, you're changing an element in a very, very complicated, an actual real puzzle, because it is a puzzle, a three dimensional puzzle uh, with a lot of living systems in it. I I've got to check. <laughs> no, yeah, and I, you know, I think sometimes clients might think like, well, I mean, is it, how hard could it be, right? No, sure. I like, would we'll just put a door there instead of here. Like, what is it? What is the big deal? Uh, it's not a big deal if you don't really care about what you're doing, right. right? It's possible to put this stuff there, but you might have a bunch of stuff hanging from the ceiling, and then is that okay? Like, you don't hire an architect to like make it work. You hire mm-hmm. an architect to get it done right. That's why right. you hire an architect for That's what we do. We're going to do it right. We're yeah. not just going to get it done. We're going to get it done and do it right. But in the ter- in terms of uh, creating CDs, it, it reminded me that an, an, one thing the architect does that I think is even more specific to this profession uh, than almost any other profession is we visualize that yeah. is a big, big part of what we do. A lot of creatives visualize, yes, but you know, uh, obviously. So, and and a, a lot of creative professions, you are the making process and the designing process are really close to each other, right? Um, so, if we talk about a muralist, for example, they have a, an idea of what's going to happen. Uh, they have a, a sketch, in essence, of what the mural is going to be. But when they're out there painting the wall, that's when it's happening. And, and that's kind of cool because the designing, the, the ideation, all that stuff is being wrapped up into one moment. Yeah. And that's, that's lovely. But for architects, it's different because we have to imagine this thing and visualize it completely in the conceptual realm. Now, of course, we have tools, you know, computer softwares, VR, and things like this to help us. But still, we have to visualize. And in terms of CDs, construction drawings are just two-dimensional drawings. There's not really a lot of perspectives in there because it doesn't work. We need dimensions. We need details and stuff. So you're looking at 2D flat drawings of this three-dimensional thing and the ability to look at a set of 2D drawings and visualize what that means in 3D and how this thing is interacting with other stuff going in other axes, directions, right, is a weird thing. And um, it's pretty unique, I think, to architects and other professions where design and building are, are, are relatively separate. So visualizing is something that architects do um, and in and, and, and the inverse as well. Um, before you mentioned... I don't know, event planner or something. I think another way to understand what the architect does when it gets to coordination and things is in the typical team structure for a typical project, the relationship, uh, if you can visualize listeners, you have the client, then the architect, and then you have everyone else. Meaning to say that the architect is the in-between person, is the bridge between the client and all the other consultants, including most most often, most typically, the contractors, the engineers, anyone else who would need, right? That's the the That's line kind of, of the communication. Standard, yeah, line right. of communication, and that makes sense again because you need one person that everyone can go to. You of cannot course. just go to each other and no, hope no. that you know everything's going to make sense at the end. Mm-hmm. You need to respond to one person or go to one person, so you don't have to have multiple chains of communication. Yeah, and all those people, right? Like a tree, they're feeding in down to that one person, that's the architect. Now, I, I would, uh, I'll say quickly, you know, one question is like, why Why is the architect that one person? Why not the contractor? Why not the engineer? Why not whoever, whoever? Because most often in a process, the architect is the one person, if you do it correctly, who will be with you from the very beginning to the very end. No one else is going to be there from the very beginning to the very end, most in, in a typical kind of uh, project scenario, right? Um, and of course, they have the design in mind, and it's that balancing between technical and design. Um, so I think that's that flow of communication. Uh, hopefully, does a good job of helping people understand, like, what does an architect do? Well, imagine yourself; you're in that position. You're responding to the client on your left, and on your right, you have 15 other people telling you all this stuff. What do you think that would entail? What kind of skill sets and responsibilities and tasks would have to happen, right, for a project? Well, that's the answer. Yep. Yeah. Now. We get to 
almost construction. <laughs> we have CDs, right? Okay, so okay, so now that we have construction documents done, and you know this order of of phases and sequence varies by project. Like it, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, it's, yeah, it's flexible. Um, but the next big thing is getting all of your permits approved so you can start construction. And the role of the architect then is to stamp the drawings, yes, because you need a professional that puts their liability on the line so, you know, the project can be done, right? Uh, <laughs> what does an architect do? We stamp things! So we, st we stamp. Uh, but, you know, there is a lot of... The, the, the knowledge that you have to have in order to understand what a building needs in terms of legal aspect and safety aspect and like building codes and all those things mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. You know, like we probably heard in previous recordings, like we have, and you know, have, we used to have seven exams to become licensed professionals. Now we have five. It's six, a, six, six, six. Six? Yeah, six. Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah six. Okay, yeah. Six. So, I mean, you know, that's that's a lot. And there is a lot to know. And building codes vary depending on where you're located, what country you're in, what types of project you're working on. It's it's a very complicated uh, ball game, right? Um, so architects have to have that knowledge mm -hmm. in order to feel comfortable enough to stamp a drawing. <laughs> yep. So that, 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 that takes a lot. <clears throat> yeah. And, and that's a more straightforward task, but that is a big part of what we do. Obviously, you um, know, so it's when, mandatory. And... You know, yeah. So when people hire architects just to get the stamp, you can do that if you are an architect who are fine just setting your stamp for money. Basically, it's what it is. But you kind of have to like, <laughs> it's what it is, right? Like <laughs> architect of work, it's it's architectural prostitution. That's what it is. <laughs> um, you know, but you have to understand that it's there is a huge gap between standing a drawing that you have not done for a building that you have not designed just to get it through the door of, of having a permits versus stamping something that you know by heart from A to Z, you know, you know and, and you, you give to an agency to approve. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a legal responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. It's not just a stamp on a drawing. Like there is like extremely uh, important legal aspect linked to that stamp. Sure. Yep. So just something I wanted to point out <laughs> okay that's great i think i think that covers that pretty, pretty you know neatly. because people are like oh there, can i just there... get a stamp on my drawings it's like yeah you can but you have to understand what that stamp yeah. means right, right. <laughs> um finally i think we can wrap a bidding and negotiation and construction just into one thing Big, bidding and negotiation is when basically you're looking for an, arch, uh, an architect looking for a contractor contractors bid on the project or you negotiate with a contractor and you select a contractor yeah i mean you know when you're looking to hire someone to build your project you can go with the first guy that comes to you if you feel comfortable mm -hmm. or you can kind of not shop around but make sure that the price you're getting are fair or you know are make sense with what was designed um, and the way that an architect can help you with that is that they can suggest to you a few builders that they're familiar with and that they trust because mm -hmm. hiring a contractor is, is hiring someone you trust to get things done right um, and not just have a guy who you hire, takes the money and run away and your thing never gets built, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so the architect, what they do, they can, have, they can advise on who to uh, ask for mm -hmm. that. They can interview the contractors because we are the ones who put the drawing set together. We know it really well. So it makes sense, you know, if to interview the contractors because they're going to have questions about these drawings. And the best person to answer those questions are the ones who did the drawings. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. Yeah, um, it's also a way to for architects during that interview process to see how much the contractor paid attention to the drawings. Do they even have questions? Like, are they knowledgeable in that type of building? Um, you know, type and 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 project. Is it their first one? You know, it's a way. It's a way for the client to kind of um, uh, veto you know, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the people who are going to be hired. And I think it, it makes a lot of sense. And then what happens typically is that after the architect interviews the contractor, they report back to the client and be like, okay, well, I think this guy is reasonable. This guy has a lot of experience. This one we're not so sure about, you know. Uh, and also sometimes things come up in the drawings. You know, someone saw something during the review of the drawings and they're like, I think we could do something more efficient here. I think there is a problem here. So it's it's kind of like you're already starting the communication by doing the interview uh, with the yeah. architect. So I think uh, architect as interviewer and vetter is, mm -hmm. is, is really important here. 
Um, and there's a skill set that comes with interviewing, right? It's not just about knowing the drawings. It's about, again, asking the right questions and reading people to a certain degree and, and vetting them, um, which is important for bidding and negotiation. And that yeah. whole bidding process, too, you know, like you could do it yourself. What do you need your architect? Because uh, at that point, you trust your architect. And also at that point, there's not really anything the architect has to gain by hiring one guy or the other. You know, no, it's uh, true. You know, we're doing it to make sh to help out the client and not so much for our own sake. But see, this is where um, this comment I'm going to make ties into construction as well. Is I think there's this notion of well, if you're a good architect and you produce a good set of construction drawings and documents, and that's what's going to be used in the field by the builder to know what the design intent to build the build to build the building. Um, why do I need an architect then? Right. Right. Everything is there. And, 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 and in a certain sense, I can understand it. It's like, I think people might visualize this as sort of like a tinker toy instruction set or Lego instructions. It's like, okay, you reverse, you know, you design something, right. Then you reverse engineered it and you made an instruction set sort of, uh, it's, it's not linear in that we don't do like steps one, two, three, four, five, cause that's not what we do, but still the drawings are breaking down how the thing is going to be composed um you know so i yeah i give my six-year-old right a legos instruction set there are the legos there's the building materials they build it like what's there to do uh well first just the sheer complexity and the number of weird corners and things that exist in any given decent sized project means that you need that you need the architect the person who created drawings to stay on board you just you need it you need you need it um and the second thing is that during the um so so what that means that is that during bidding and negotiation it is not a good idea for you the client to take your cds and be like okay i'm going to interview these people because if they have any questions about the design or technical things you're probably not going to have an answer because that's not what you do presumably um when we move to construction uh what i just said explains why an architect would have to stay on during construction um, and typically, what does an architect do during construction? They provide construction administration services. What the heck is that? I mean, it really depends on the, the, the type and, and scale of the project. But, you know, it could be um, uh, the contractor sends you drawings for something that needs to be fabricated. Like, let's say, a kitchen cabinets, right? The, the mill worker creates his fabrication drawings, sends it to the contractor. Contractor looks at it, it looks fine. It's sent it to the architect. The architect looks at it and is like, okay, it looks great. Or no, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Or you're missing something here. Or how is this attached? Then What's... it's approved and then it can go to fabrication. So it's kind of like another layer of communication and quality insurance toward the fabrication of the project. Yeah. So this goes back, right? Like I said in the beginning, uh, what does an architect do? They design buildings and help ensure, this is a poorly phrased sentence, but help ensure that the thing gets realized, right? Yeah. Um, or it could be, uh, okay, well, you know what? The toilet that you wanted for your bathroom, it's no longer made. We need mm -hmm. to find another one. I'm here, the contractor, find another one. What do you think? We looked at it. It doesn't work with the space we have in the wall or the layout, so we can't use that one. We gotta find another one. Yeah. Right? So you're talking about uh, responding to. So the architect is during construction administration. The architect is is responding to any communication that comes from the contractor. Yeah. That could be submittals, like we said, like shop drawings of things that would be fabricated. It could be a request for information, also known as RFIs. Yeah. If someone has a question, it could be about a change order. You need to change something in the design, change a toilet, change a layout, change a move a window. Yeah. You know, something came up we didn't realize. That's handled by the architect. And um, all the thing yeah, all the things you mentioned, they will come up during a project there's no project that happens without any of this stuff it's not possible <laughs> for a building just to be constructed based off of construction drawings and then that's it like <laughs> it's like, not it's not and to, if you don't have the architect on board you're the client taking on that role that you're gonna have to trust that you're making the right decision in whichever solution you're going to go with so there's a couple things to break down here uh the first is defining what shop drawings are what are shop drawings compared to construction drawings because I already, I'm talking as a client, I already thought right. we have construction drawings. What what are these shop drawings? Why do we need shop drawings? Well, shop drawings, again, like, I don't know, you have, um, 
you have a concrete slab, right? Mm -hmm. Structural engineer has his slab is um, slab edge plan that mm -hmm. shows, you know, like the limits of the slab, where the rebar is going to go, mm -hmm. the dimensions of the opening, mm -hmm. and like a bunch mm -hmm. of calculation, all of that. Fine. Once you get sharp drawings, the guy who's going to fabricate that slab is going to tell you like what is the mix that's going to go f to make the concrete, what size rebar, you know, like where is the how the rebars attached to each other. Like we're looking at the drawings with an even more detailed uh, look, and it's it's again a drawing that was done by a certain person in the line of the process, right? So like. You know, floor plan is the level of the architect, and then structural engineer is the slab edge plan. And then the guy who's going to do, the contractor who's going to pour the slab and do the slab, is looking at it with another set of eyes. His specialist. Right? Like his, yeah. his, the way he looks at it is right. like much more detailed. Yeah. So that drawing is detailed because that's what he needs to, to do his part of the job. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it, you know, the, 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 the goal is like to see how he's thinking of building it. Right, so we can make sure that it works with what we anticipated, because again, let's say change that opening to a different size. Well, that's going to impact the layout, where the walls are going to go, and where the plumbing, the plumber is going to put his pipe. So coordination keeps happening even during construction, not just during the design part, but also during construction. The difference between construction drawings and shop drawings, um, and now we're getting more into process, but just as so people know, is. Um, you may have recognized that earlier I say construction drawings convey the design intent, mm -hmm. which is weird because it's like, well, if they're construction drawings, shouldn't they be conveying like construction stuff? And they do, but t but it legally in terms of the contract, uh, it's the, it, they're conveying design intent. Um, so if we have cabinetry, that's another example, right? Yep. The construction drawings convey the design of the cabinetry, right? What it's going to look like in the end. And that would involve um, some some of the details, yes, for sure. But how the thing actually gets fabricated, the exact type of screw that's going to be used, and the exact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the case also, when you get to cabinetry, right, the ex exact dimensions of the room you don't have until the walls are up, right? Shop drawings are without confusing people more. Shop drawings are like the actual construction drawings the fabrication drawings you know it's and one it, way to yeah fabrication you, drawings if you think about construction drawings done by the architect they have there is the overall project all of the pieces of the project are into those drawings mm -hmm. everything has been thought together right then the architect gives a set of construction documents to the contractor the contractor looks at it and then what he does is he basically split it into a bunch of different pieces because he has the drawing, he has the plumber who's going to work on this part he has the wood he has the, the electrician millwork, and yeah, the right. mill worker who's going to work on that he has the slab guy he has you know like the the painter yeah. right and each are going to take a bite out of this CD set mm -hmm. right and they're all going to look at it with a magnifier glass for what they have to do but they're not going to look at it with the big picture. Mm -hmm. That's why you cannot bypass construction drawings from the architect. Yeah, you need it's it's a crucial step into getting the actual thing built. You know, correctly. Yep, yep, yep absolutely. Um, so in construction, so that's responding to RFIs <laughs> and shop drawings and all those things. That's a big part of what we do and what an architect does is is, is you know, a lot of time is spent looking at shop drawings because like you like you we talked about like those are fabrication drawings if you approve them and the architect is in charge of approving if they get approved you know and you say you say client this is good for approval and the client says okay we're good to go and you didn't catch something uh that's a problem and that's also why construction is very construction is very complicated but fortunately and it takes a long time, which sucks, but it's kind of a good thing because there's a lot of checks and balances throughout the process. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a lot of opportunities to find problems, which is almost needed because, man, there's a lot of stuff to consider. Um, so there, there's that portion of, of what we do during CA, when we're doing CA, construction administration. The other thing is um, uh, general site observation. Right. Yeah. The other thing is like besides, you know, picking up phone calls and responding to emails with a bunch of questions, what the architect does to during construction is that we go on site just to make sure that things are moving forward, that we're staying on track, that, you know, there wasn't any big mistake 
uh, that was happening on on the construction or if you know the contractor has a question about something that needs to get resolved that we didn't foresee anywhere before mm -hmm. um you know like we come come to the site look at it report back and come up with a solution um it, it's kind of a way for the client to have someone monitoring uh, you know the construction yes. process without themselves having to be involved with everything that comes with yeah and to be clear you know the architect is not responsible for the means and methods or safety on site there's a whole list of things that we're not responsible for that's what the contractor does right when we go on site and actually to uh, uh, to to explain in more detail the difference between contractor and architect if we see a safety issue on site right what we have to do is report to the contractor. If we see a means and methods issue, we have to report that to the con. That's his responsibility, his alone, not ours. But so, what, so what do we do when we go there? Uh, we're looking for uh, conformance with the design intent. Um, so that, uh, and and also, I think maybe some people think like, well, you again, you have construction drawings. The contractor builds off that. Like, what's the issue? Well, a lot of times there contractors and projects they build things not according to the drawings because they overlooked it or they sometimes intentionally forget about things <laughs> intentionally forget you know or there's a mistake or whatever and it's really difficult for a person to come to a site that's under construction which is fucking chaos look around and say like that doesn't look right <laughs> yeah. you know amidst all the chaos the loud the hammering the sawing and all the guts are there there's materials everywhere and the point of the corner be like that doesn't look right um you know requires a certain kind of under a very deep level understanding of the project and an uh you know comfort level essentially too um so but we're looking for design conformance yeah yeah we're not going to site to inspect that things are like built right or like functioning properly uh, you know in terms of like plumbing or electricity or things like that that that's not our expertise that's what the contractor is there for we're looking for built right in terms of design but we're yeah. we're because again we're the ones who know the design the best I mean, you know, if you think about the contractor, his role is extremely complex. Yeah. He has a ton of people to manage, oftentimes a very limited amount of time to get things done. You know, people working in the same spaces on the same things and looking at drawings that he's never seen before and he's just learning as he goes. Uh, you know, it's a lot of information to process and understand. And as much as architects try to be clear with drawings, you can't have drawings for every single thing. No. Um, you know, so oftentimes you do the major ones, but some of them could present a challenge on site because, you know, you, there is a weird condition there and that happens. Yeah. And the role for us to go is really kind of giving them another look uh, on site to, you know, about the, the, the design itself that we know best and, and, you know, kind of help that way in a sense. Yeah, I mean, you could in theory produce a set of drawings that explains everything, but it would be a waste of time. It would um, take forever. Like you would take forever, and it's it's a, and it's, it sounds dumb, but it's a, it's a more efficient way. At some point, you just gotta move forward. Um, and smaller issues can be taken care of pretty easily in construction because you just you know <laughs> tear down, rebuild it, or hammer it out, or whatever. Um, but so there there is this big portion of construction administration uh, during construction, which is a, a kind of negotiation and communication between the architect and the contractor. So if we get on site and something's not built according to the design intent, according to the CDs, the construction drawings, uh, it's our responsibility to tell the contractor obviously through written language uh fix it fix it and if it if if it was depending on who is at fault essentially you know fix it at no cost to the client or the client pays for it depending yeah and, and depending on what it is and when it would it was caught too like is it you take it down or you redo it or we can't take it down therefore okay yeah. we got to come up with a solution that's gonna resolve things so i think architect as translator is a good way to describe a, a hefty portion of the responsibility in this process um, if you imagine this process without the architect and you're the client and you're there on site you're looking at stuff and let's somehow imagine that you're aware of a problem maybe because you had the ability to see it or the contractor brought it up to you um, the contractor again his responsibilities are within a certain kind of uh, zone right he's gonna come to you he or she's gonna come to you with uh, a response for based on their responsibilities uh, ease of construction efficiency schedule costs 
these are more their priorities rather than like a pretty looking thing at the end because uh, in most cases the aesthetics of the thing in the end the design uh, frankly is not directly tied to their financial gain and bottom line but cost of redoing work delay in schedules paying for more material more labor that obviously is so but anyway so the architect is, acts as a translator because they would take that information from the contractor right think about it from our perspective with the knowledge we have about the design and construction and all the other things and then turn out uh, a, a solution and or when we go and then re relay that to the client if it's a bigger issue and say here are the issues at hand we would describe to them in a way that the uh, client can understand first first and foremost what's happening and then advise them on what to do what, what what's the best course of action and there is a whole different language to the way buildings are, are uh, in terms of how buildings are, are constructed. Construction language. There's technical, like actual verbal technical language that most clients don't know about. So when a contractor shows up and they start spewing out technical things in front of a client, um, a lot of times it's not helpful because the client's like, I have no idea. And there's an assumed, this gets to another thing too, but there's an assumed expertise when you do that. When I start spewing out a bunch of verbiage, right, that's very technical, I sound like an expert and you have to trust what I'm saying because as far as you're concerned, it's black magic over here or it's magic, right? Um, so part of our job is, is, is to take that and say, okay, <laughs> client, here's what's actually happening. Right. Here, here it is in layman terms and here's what we can do about it. Uh, and that's a very important thing, very, very important thing because uh, a lot of times um, you, you would say, well, why don't contractors do that? A lot of times they do, but a lot of times they don't. Uh, because it's not to their advantage in a lot of instances to it's be totally advantage. honest. They don't have the time and, yeah. you know, sometimes it's small issues, like, doesn't really matter to them back big, compared to the big picture. Um, right. Well, but, the, but you know, doesn't matter also gets back to visual, visualization, right? Because yeah. when you are on site during the heat of construction, the battle of construction, and uh, the architect points out an issue and says, you know, that's a problem because for design reasons, it's not going to align and whatever, whatever. It's very easy uh, for for people who don't have that visual, that concept, that the visualization of the final outcome to say like, ah, no big deal. Like, mm. all this crazy mess going on, like, yeah, it's fine, not a big deal. Um, but it is a big deal because you're paying a lot of money for this thing. You paid money for, to have a design, to have an architect. So one of the things that we do is we make sure that the thing that you are paying for you're going to get and that requires going on site once a week twice a week and pointing at stuff and saying you know fix this fix that this is not right and uh you know i i get for for some contractors like it's a nuisance it's like oh architecture <laughs> again it's gonna, they're gonna point out stuff but that's like that's our job that's what we have to do and again it's the visualization skill set right it's really difficult to do uh, during construction, but that's what what has to happen, and that's why a lot of times you look at buildings or or final architecture, and you're like, oh, this is weird. There's a lot of reasons why that weird scenario might have occurred, and one of them, uh, fairly often, is that something happened during construction, someone didn't catch it, or frankly, people got lazy because it's like six months and 10 months in the process you're like oh let's just move on i don't care about this thing anymore and now in the end you look at this weird corner and you're like i wish we had spent an extra two days resolving this you know so that's that's um so visualization catching things uh being a rigorous uh is is another aspect of what we do and and you know i mean uh you know, when you think construction, often times people think like big framing, open walls, like plumbing, right? But then, as you get into the more toward the more finished aspect of construction, mm -hmm. you know, an outlet that's not in the right spot or a light that's not center, like that could like bother you <laughs> once you move oh, yeah. in. So the role of the architect too is close to completion of the construction. You know, we'll do walkthroughs with the contractor and the clients yep. and kind of point at the small things that need fixing. To just make the place feels right because sometimes it is just about the small things that just don't do it, you know, yeah. that were supposed to but like didn't quite work. Um, that needs to be fixed. And architects in general are, are perfectionists, right? Uh, because we we have this vision, we have this design, we want it to be executed correctly. And again, if you work backwards, like what does it take to make sure this thing is done correctly? Well, you, you would show up, 
very often to make sure it's done correctly. You'd have a bunch of benchmarks. You'd have a bunch of, uh, quote unquote, not, they're not called inspections, but essentially inspections. It'd be very detail oriented. And you would not be afraid to ask for things when it's uncomfortable. And, and be, and, and also in, on all of this too, the architect, you know, essentially acts as a adjudicator in some regards uh, in the client contractor architect uh, relationship right there's these different forces that play between the three and our job is is a kind of to be an arbitrator and mediator and adjudicator um I, I think another good way to think about what we do during construction especially is we're an advisor to the client we're like your friend yeah, yeah, yeah. that has a lot of expertise who knows the project the best and we're going to help you <laughs> because again we have you know besides being paid all the time we spend doing that we have nothing to gain by having things done right versus just getting it done well there's nothing for us to gain by having it done incorrectly yeah so it's, it is a checks and balances system that's yeah. partially why it exists um I think that covers, uh, there's a lot more that we do, but I think that that gives a good uh, kind of rounding. Yeah, this is more about like uh, the different many hats that an architect has to wear or the different qualities that an architect would have. It's not so much about the types of deliverables or like design services that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you would hire an architect for. I think that could probably be another recording. It's much more about understanding kind of what it takes to be an architect in a sense. Yeah, and uh, th that's also why we find that architects, or people who study architecture a lot of times go off to do other things and they're pretty successful in it, in creative, in creative endeavors and things. Because the way that we work, architects work, is uh, what do you do? I do whatever is required of me to design something that's awesome and to make sure it gets realized. That's what I do. And that automatically means, as exhibited by this recording, a whole bunch of different things. Yeah. Because you're working backwards from the end, right? I want to execute this thing perfectly. I want to design it perfectly. What does that require? It could be whatever it is. And there's probably a bunch of stuff we didn't list. If, if it's required and necessary, it's going to help it. That's what we do. Okay, well, thank you, listeners. We hope uh, you enjoyed this recording. As usual, please leave us a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Um, if you're not on there, you can always subscribe, I believe, on Spotify. Mm -hmm. A lot of our interviews and some of our other episodes, such as this one, are also on YouTube. So you can subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so every time a new episode comes out, you get notified. Ring -a -ling. If you also like what we're doing, and you want to reach out and just communicate with us, or you have a question, you're like, well, what about this aspect of architecture or what architects do or et cetera, et cetera. You could reach out to us via email, hello at secondstudiopod.com or shoot us a text or call our hotline, which is 213-222-6950. And if you call it, it goes straight to voicemail. So there's no concern of like having an awkward conversation with one of us. And of course you can text it and we'll get, that, get it that way too. And we'll try to reply to you uh, in some fashion. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, so you can find us on there as well, right? You can find us on there. Watch for our stories on Instagram. Uh, every Tuesday, we release our episodes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you can, you can again, turn on the notifications so you know when we post. <laughs> okay. I discovered that a few months ago. I actually yeah. love it. Like, I oh, have really? a few people, like, I turn on notifications. So every time they post something, I'm like, oh, they just posted something. <laughs> okay. Let's go check, okay. you know? Who? Um, yeah, no, Robert Pattinson? Business. I don't think he's on Instagram. Uh, no. I wish you were on Instagram. Tom Hardy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's on Instagram. Those people, are, they're know. too cool for yeah, Instagram. Yeah, they're too cool. Yeah. Um, okay, I think that's it. Uh, you know, thanks again for listening. We really appreciate that you guys are doing that. Um, we're at episode like 200 and... I don't know where we're at now. 220 Yeah, and I mean, something. you know, it'd be nice to sort of find out how you're all doing, how you found out about the show, what you like mm -hmm. about the show, how you're doing, where you're from. Like, get a little bit curious Curiosity. about our listeners. Yeah. Let's make friends. <laughs> okay. If you liked this recording, then head to secondstudiopod.com and check out our other design companion episode types. And uh, we will talk to you again next week or sooner. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.